Good evening and welcome to Chatroom. My guest tonight is regarded as one of New Zealand's most talented young pianists. He also has an extensive teaching practice as an adjudicator, a masterclass presenter and of course a recitalist. Recently returned from Florida State University where he completed his doctorate, it's my pleasure to welcome Ludwig Trevanis. Hi Ludwig, welcome. How are you Catherine? I'm good. Nice to meet you. Now, First question has to be, if I was your agent, right. I couldn't come up with a better stage name for a pianist right. than Ludwig. Absolutely. Tell me about your name, wonderful right. name. Right, so Ludwig Trevranus. The name Ludwig comes from the King of Bavaria. So my father was over in Germany, and when he went to the castle Neuschwanstein, right, he was there and realised the king's got a wonderful name, Ludwig, and if I have a son, we'll call him Ludwig. The chances that I was going to play piano... Mm wasn't there at the beginning. Um, the piano was sent over to my family from my grandparents um, very early on. And so when I was born, I would get up to the piano and use fists to play and off we go. So Ludwig just happens to match mm. the name. But it's almost as if your father had a premonition May of, well of things been. to come. May mm. well have been. And mm. so that's it. It's so often people will ask, is it a stage name? Well, no. Fortunately, it's the real name, Ludwig Chevranis. So the family itself, my father is part German, part mm. Samoan. My mother is full Samoan. And so that makes people even, there's more confusion there as well. Yes. Uh, so he's part Samoan, part German, and I play the piano. Mm. But so that actually it. gives you a wonderfully rich heritage. Yeah. Because when you think about, you know, the strength of music in Germany, mm -hmm. and then the, you know, Pacific Islanders, you know, natural musicians. So right. you're kind of blending it's great. It's, together. It's a great fusion. It's a mm. great fusion. It's a great fusion of, of culture, of discipline, of um, the work of orators in Samoa as mm. well. And, you know, I speak about this quite often. The Samoans um, tell stories. We love to tell stories, myths, legends. And the idea that I can bring that to piano music, which is about storytelling, is wonderful. And also the rich heritage of music that has gone through mm. Germany, the greatest composers have come through that. Um, I can feel that in my, my body as well. Mm. Um, so it's a real privilege and almost a just a great combination for mm. me when I get up into the stage and I feel both bloods in me. Mm. But you don't have to wear lederhosen. No, none of that. No, no, no. no I no. just wear this blue shirt and get on with it. Which is great. <laughs> now, you just mentioned that the piano arrived and you used to bang on it as yes, a child. Yes. When did the formal lessons start? Five and a half. Why so early? Lessons started at five and a half. Well, we had a friend, a family friend that had started quite early as well. And when we asked the parents, what age can children start? And they said, well, children can start as early as three. Um, I feel that my parents were um, under the impression that I have to start quite a little mm -hmm. later. Um, so in fact, once I began my lessons at the age of five and a half, that was it. There was no turning back. And so I continued and never stopped. And it was a great thing for me to begin early. I learned through Suzuki methods. Yes. Suzuki methods, so a lot of my playing was from hearing, you know. And it made sense because we hear before we can speak. And so... I took it from there and I still use it now, a lot of my hearing when I play, when it comes to improvisation or when I play pop music and hear things on the radio, I use a lot of the hearing and it's benefited me hugely. Mm. So it began very early. Did you have particularly musical parents? I mean obviously we've talked about this rich heritage, mm -hmm. but were they singers or instrument players? We would sing at church yep. and we sing at home and sing for the functions and we always enjoy, we enjoy socialising, we enjoy partying. Um, but other than that, there, were no, there was no formal training as such. Um, and so I guess it was just having the piano there and being in a culture that loves to make music. Mm. Um, that got me on board mm. and that got me to, to play the piano and to share my story through music. Yeah. Now, of course, lots of children learn mm. an instrument, learn piano. So when was it discovered or decided that this could actually become a career for you, that you, you were good enough to be a concert pianist? I may well have been 16 or 17. Uh, this is just before I left high school. I was at Hutton's National Boys School um, in Trentham. And when I was year 12 or form 6, they put a fundraiser concert on for me, knowing that I was heading out. And so I did a concert with my friends. We did some jazz. We did some classical and it was at that moment that I realized I have something to say, but most importantly, I mean, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And I figured, well, if I have the opportunity to travel with this and share it with numerous people and different audiences, I think this could be a good life. And so that was in 2002, and then enrolled into the University of Auckland mm. in 2003 and never turned back. So it was that concert 
Um, and so I'm happy that it's mm. happened early on. Mm. And that was a, really a defining moment. It was a defining mm. moment. It was. And then from there, I just discovered my journey mm. and then spent nine years at university um, with different teachers, learning different methods, listening to different music, um, and just self-exploring. And now everything is over. I'm continuing to do that now. Mm. And I get to perform. And it's, it, was, it was a great path. It was the right path. It was the right path for you. Absolutely. Now, research shows that, unfortunately, our children get to 11, 12, mm -hmm. and there's this huge drop-off mm -hmm. in, in learning of an instrument. We'll talk about the why a little later on and get mm -hmm. your thoughts on that. But did you go through that phase or stage where it was just, oh, I'm over practice, I'm sick of doing this? Um, I found at times that because I'd arrived at high school, um, there were so many other activities that you could partake in, so many other cliques, if you will. So basically, to answer that question, I believe that when you, you arrive at, at high school, college, you've just got this multitude of activities mm -hmm. you can select from. So of course, naturally you're going to be thinking, maybe I could try something else, or maybe I can do this. I believe the interest is still there, mm. but having all these other distractions, if you will, or other options, makes it difficult to focus on one mm. thing. When I arrived at college, um, I began doing competitions. And I found that my, I seemed to be doing quite well. And from that, my self-esteem grew. Yes. So it was the opposite for me. I actually became stronger. And so about 12, 13, 14, I did have my doubts at times, mm. especially because there were very few people at my school that were playing classical music mm. and playing it seriously. Um, so part of the reason why I felt a little detached at times was just that loneliness. Mm. Well, who am I going to share it with? Who, nobody, I, can, mm. I can't relate to anybody. Um, but I found myself through other musicians that were in, in Wellington, mm. or if I traveled up to mm. Auckland, um, and I had a great supportive teacher and supportive family. Mm. But it's a really interesting question because it's definitely something that needs to be addressed and for, I guess, mentors and parents not to worry about. There's no disinterest. Mm. It's the idea that we have now, well, the, the child has now come to grips with so many other activities mm. and they're excited. Um, but I feel as a teacher, when I work with students that are that age 12, 13, to continue nurturing their, their excitement for music and also asking them what other activities that they're doing at school mm. or how those activities can relate mm. to music. Um, once I begin ignoring the other co-curricular mm. activities, that's where I feel as a teacher, mm. I get in trouble. Yeah, and having an understanding that they've got busy lives as well. That's we'll, right. We'll pick up that's on right. that a little mm -hmm. bit more in our next segment. Tonight we're talking to pianist Ludwig Trevoranis. More from him shortly. Welcome back to Chatroom. Well, Ludwig, you completed your master's at Auckland University mm. under the in incredible Ray Leal, mm. and then you went off to Florida that's State right. University for your doctorate. Mm -hmm. Now, how did Florida come about? Florida came about um, because of a teacher. His name is Dr. Reed Gainsford, um, who's also a Kiwi. That's a great name it's, too. Yeah, yeah. Reed Gainsford. <laughs> yes, very American. And yeah. so, no, it was it was great. He came over for a workshop. He was speaking about the music of a French composer, Olivier Messier. And on sitting in his lecture, there was just a real connection between myself and the music, and also himself, the speaker. Mm. And so I addressed him at the end. I said, you know, it would be nice to play a couple of pieces to you. And then from there we, we created our friendship and we found out actually there's a possibility I can go and study with him at Florida State University. So in 2008 I flew over and I had my audition and then lo and behold I, I mm. got myself a position and spent four years under his tutelage. Mm. Now you competed while you were in the States as well. How did, did that go? I did. That was really fun. You did it very well really in the Beethoven competition I, did. I think. No, yep. it was great. They had, yep. a, they had the International Sadata competition in Memphis. So I went there to play piano and eat ribs, mm -hmm. and it was delicious, <laughs> and I was very happy. And so I arrived there. It was, it was, to me, it was a time to learn and explore, um, make new friends with the other pianists who are also competing at a very high mm -hmm. level. And so I met you know, students from Juilliard, from mm -hmm. Yale, wow. um, from schools in California, from schools um, East Coast, West Coast. There were a lot of musicians. Um, and I was very lucky to get a place, mm -hmm. and so that was really cool. And that there, um, I guess, gave me that confidence, mm -hmm. that extra confidence as well as the training that I've had in New Zealand, mm -hmm. it can match up mm -hmm. to the training that I have mm -hmm. to, to those that are in America. Um, and so I think to me that was a huge turning point. 
um, in terms of my trust and my ability and, and our system here in New Zealand. Mm. It can hold up anywhere. Um, there's this notion that you, you do well if you've come from a school with a label mm. or an Ivy League school. Um, it's not always the case. Yes, you can actually do not very well case. out of the log New Ab Zealand. Absolutely. Yep. Mm. Now, you've obviously got the ability to focus solely on being a, a concert pianist and, and a performer. Right. But you have these other strings to your bow, mm. um, adjudicator, but, yeah. but also to this desire to impart your knowledge to our young people in particular. Right. Tell me about this At Ease With Music program that so the, you devised. Yeah, At Ease mm. With Music is the idea that I'm taking classical music and breaking it down to simpler forms so that young and old alike can appreciate what they're hearing. So for instance, when I took the show around to the schools in Wellington, I spent about a couple of months speaking in assemblies and playing excerpts from, say, a piece of pop music. And then I would play a piece by Beethoven or Mozart that perhaps related to it. They could find a thread and, sit and talk to them about how the music, its origin, comes from classical music. I would also play classical music itself, for instance, maybe a piece by Haydn, mm -hmm. something that was joyful. And I would go through the different characters and I would say to them, listen to this. What does it sound like to you? Does it sound like somebody is trudging through the woods? Does it sound like somebody is sad? Um, and so what I did is I used classical music as a, as a vehicle to help open the imaginations mm. of the students. And that it wasn't just a bunch of notes, but rather they were small stories mm. or characters. And there's no right or wrong answer. Mm. Um, and that's so, the beauty of it. And that's it. Mm. And once the student knows, or just the listener knows there's no right or wrong answer, oh, you're at ease. And that's where the concept came from. And so I, I've, I split up classical music into its, its four main periods. I had some music from the Baroque period, classical period, the Romantic period, and the 20th century. Um, just hits people that, pieces that people know. Um, and then from there, I just broke it down quite simply and I tried to take away all the academic jargon mm -hmm. and speak of it um, from my own point of view, my mm -hmm. own reflections, and it went down pretty well. I it bet. It was really exciting. Yeah. Now there's a certain pretension, I think, or there can be, or, or obviously intellectualism about classical music, which sometimes I think can be a little off-putting. Mm. Why do you think it's so important that, that our children have this exposure to classical music? First of all, classical music allows the child um, to express something without words. You understand? Classical music, especially instrumental music, there are no lyrics. But it allows them to think for themselves outside of the box and not judge a piece by the lyrics that are coming from the radio. And I think that's hugely important. It develops um, a different way of thinking. It expands the mind. It also teaches the child about history about this is what people used to listen to back in the day. This is the music that um, people out in the public listen to, the commoners. This is music that the royals listen mm. to. Um, there's something to be said about listening to a piece of music without knowing any bit of the history and coming up with your own story. And I think that it's, it's so vital to, to use that, to have classical music, not only in the classrooms, but also in the home. Um, and not just to listen to it, but to speak about it. Mm. Not of, we don't often speak about music. We listen to it and we go as far as saying, that sounded beautiful. Mm. But classical music allows us to ask, why is it beautiful? Yes. Mm. That's wonderful. Mm. It's a wonderful tool. So it's not just for entertainment, but it's also a wonderful teaching tool. Mm. Um, then if that child is given the opportunity to play it or practice it, that takes it further. That takes it further and it gives them the opportunity to discover, oh, I too can make a happy sound. Or I too can portray something that's sad. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. It really does broaden the mind. It broadens their um, expression. Mm. Um, so it's a wonderful tool. Because I imagine that, that some of the children who might have come along to it ease would not necessarily have had much exposure to classical music. No. What kind of reaction did you get? Um, wide eyes. Mm -hmm. Wide eyes, laughing. Um, I made sure that I exaggerated my movements, and so if I wanted to play something loud, I'd throw my hands up in the air. If I wanted to play my something soft, I'd creep. Um, but because I wanted them not only to hear it, but also wanted to see what I was doing to create these sounds. Mm. 
you go to a concert, it's a mixture of listening, it's also a mixture of, of visual. Mm. Um, and so for them to see, he's really getting into it. Mm. It's funny and it brought, it brought them joy. They also had a lot of questions. Mm. They had a lot of questions. How do your fingers move so fast? All right. How do you play so loud? You know, why do you hunch your back when you play? And so it just proved to me that they were very observant. Mm. And they may not understand everything that is going on, mm. but they could see someone's up on stage and they were getting mm. involved in an activity. And they didn't ask you what you had for breakfast, so obviously no, they were they actually didn't. they obviously um, were enjoying the performance. They yes. didn't, mm. and it was fascinating. Mm. And um, I remember one child came up to me and said, "You know, I I want to go up now to the rugby field and start training again." I said, "Good for you. Go out there and do it." Mm. Um, you know, and so and that's that's great if you can get some kind of reaction. Positive or negative, it's fine. Obviously, something is connecting. Absolutely. Mm. Mm, yeah, wonderful. Mm. I was happy with that. Tonight, my guest on chat room is a pianist, Ludwig Tre Treveranis. We'll catch up with Ludwig again shortly. Welcome back to chat room. Well, Ludwig, we talked a little earlier on about the fact that a lot of intermediate age children, mm. you know, start dropping out of learning uh, right. formal instruments. And you said not as a disconnect, mm. but just that so many other things are happening in their lives. So, right, so how do right. we bring them back in? Right. Um, it's a mixture of being involved in what they're doing and showing genuine interest mm. in helping them improve this one craft. Mm. All right. Um, I think it's good to, to embrace all the other activities they're going in their life, but doing things such as going to concerts with them asking them questions about what they do, asking them to even write their own music, come up with something. There needs, there, there doesn't, we don't need any boundaries, but they can just make something up and really encourage their creativity. Yeah, now let's it's, talk about that actually, the, the improvisation, because yes. when I was, I mean, I learned, I'm not particularly good, but I learned formal classical piano for seven years. Mm -hmm. Never once was I told that Beethoven and Mozart and, and such composers used right. to compose and actually leave gaps in the score right. so the performers could improvise. Right. So I learned in that very formal style, you will follow all the instructions, yes. you will follow the notes. Mm. And I wonder if that's sometimes why our children disconnect because they don't have that personal connection. Whereas when right. you allow the improvisation, mm -hmm. that's when they really connect. Absolutely. Mm. If, you, if you give them the tools to improvise, um, they'll run with it. They'll run with it. Once you, once you allow a child, all right, here's the spoon, here's the knife, here's the fork, here's the salt, here's the pepper, and here are the ingredients, go ahead and make the cake mm. and give, give them the option, they will fly with it. Mm. They will fly with it. And you'll find they'll much, that the enjoyment Mm. of eating the cake mm. is so much more than what it was before when they served it. Giving them that tool mm. and allowing them to be expressive and there are no boundaries, mm. that's wonderful. I also think it helps them too to think critically about the formal pieces they are learning mm -hmm. and, yes. and you can say to them, well why do you think Beethoven did that? Or, or where mm -hmm. do you th you know, and, and again, right. there might right. not necessarily be a right or wrong, but it's getting them thinking about what they're playing as opposed to just I'm playing those notes that are on the page. Absolutely. Mm. You've got to think along the lines of the composer. And once you have that, you know, you've been given some tools to work mm. with, um, your appreciation mm. and understanding of the music increases mm. tenfold. So how much liberty do you take when you're performing? When I perform? Um, first of all, once I have the notes and once I have all the instruction, I then take quite a bit of liberty, actually. Um, obviously, I don't change whatever's mm. on the page but my interpretation is, is quite original. Sometimes I'll pull and I'll push the tempos as I please. Um, I rarely listen to other recordings because I feel it affects the way that I play. But a lot of the time, um, I try and be as true as possible to what's on the page. Being at classical music, it's very important to follow what's on the script. But then I have my own voice and the tone with which I use or perhaps the gestures um, are all my own. Um, but I feel the liberty comes from understanding what's on the score. Mm. First. Now another aspect of your performance too is that you break down this other barrier. You, you talk to your audience, don't you? So right. it's not just the pianist comes out, clap, 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 sit, play. Right. You actually engage with the audience, don't you? I think, and I think it's very... It's fantastic. It's, it's important. It does two things. First of all, it helps put me in a good space. So I get out there and I'm already engaging the audience. Secondly, it helps the audience understand what's about mm. to unfold. And it gives me the opportunity to point out some some things to listen out mm -hmm. for, kind of like the guide um, at a at an art exhibition. 
have a look at the colors in the back, have a look at the colors in the front and the shading, and all of a sudden you have a different interpretation of what you're seeing. So in my case, it's what you're hearing. And it works well, mm -hmm. and it works well. It just, for instance, it helps connect. Really, that's what we're looking for. The whole idea of music is, is connecting. Mm -hmm. And if I can find something that increases that, whether it be talking or whether showing a picture or showing a clip, all the better. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have any little pre-performance rituals? I believe that before he composed Beethoven, used to dunk his head in cold water. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. You see? Maybe I should try that. Yeah. Do you have anything? <laughs> do you have a lucky sort of process or a ritual, something that you go through before you perform? Um, I like to drink some Powerade, mm -hmm. blue Powerade, before I go on, and then just take a couple of breaths. Um, but other than that, there's no real ritual. Um, the ritual really begins right before I play, where I just take a deep breath, um, and I think about the music that's about to mm -hmm. come and also how I'm going to approach the keys. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important for me that I give myself a physical instruction. Mm -hmm. All right, if it's going to be a loud piece and I know exactly what I'm going to do, um, if it's going to be a soft piece, I know exactly mm -hmm. what I'm going to do. But other than that, no, there's no real mm -hmm. ritual other than... Do you get nervous? Um, time to time, mm -hmm. time to time. The nerves will come if I feel it's a relatively new work but if it's something that I've been living with and I've internalized it, it's more excitement. Mm. It's more excitement. Um, but I also, I also enjoy the nerves because it adds flair, it puts me on the edge of my seat. Mm. Adrenaline's a good thing. I, I love it, mm. yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> now, for someone at your level of performance, obviously you need to be practicing a lot. Mm -hmm. How many hours are you doing a day? If I can get in four hours a day, wow. then that's great. The practice is usually done in the morning and then in the afternoon I'll take some time off and then I teach after schools. And so I usually do about three or so hours of teaching in the afternoon. And then in the evening I might just play for fun. And that's, that's what I enjoy to do. Mm. Um, but if I can get that amount of time in, that's great. Toward a big performance, mm. the hours will increase mm -hmm. and I'll cut back on the teaching slightly. Mm. Um, but I think it's important just to do it every day. Yes. I find that's the best because there are days where I may not be able to get the four hours in. Um, but to be constantly thinking about the music, mm. that's important. Mm. That's important. I mean, once you go on tour, you're not always going to have a piano at hand. So be thinking about it. Yes. And I think it's great. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, another string to your bow is being an adjudicator. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe you're coming back to Hawke's Bay for yes. the Napier I'm Performing Arts my first... Easter Comps. That's right. Easter <clears throat> Comps is my first time coming out here to Napier to adjudicate. And I'm excited. I'm excited to hear the talent out here. I'm excited to um, meet the students, meet the teachers, um, meet the parents, and also be in, um, be in the competition, but in the adjudicator's seat. Mm because so much of my life has been spent on the stage, and now what a privilege it is to be sitting and mm. to be listening and enjoying the music mm. from the other side. Um, mm. So no, I'm very excited. Adjudicating is hard yards though. It is, because you have to be critical, um, but you also have to be compassionate, and you also have to be awake. <laughs> You really have to be awake, mm, and so you require yeah, power. Mm. It's it's true. I mean, you really need all the energy you can summon mm. to be up there and to be giving mm. every performance an equal chance mm -hmm. in terms of your attention. Mm. And so I, I constantly, every time I meet adjudicators, I take my hat off, mm. whether or whether or not I agree mm. with the with the uh, the final product. Um, I take my hat off because obviously they've thought it through thoroughly. Mm. And so this will be really exciting. It'll be mm. a really nice change. Yes. <laughs> It'll be a very nice mm. change. And so mm. I'll be excited to mm. come and mm. see you all. <laughs> well, Ludwig, it's been lovely to chat with you tonight. And um, look forward to seeing you back here for those uh, Easter comps next, next year. Absolutely. They'll come around sooner than we think. They will. See you sooner. All, all the best. Cheers. Thank you. And uh, that's a wrap for Chat Room tonight. Hope you enjoyed the show. And uh, I'll see you next time. <laughs>